Consumers, I believe, will continue to shift to buying their car online, but the tools are still just not perfect and they're not fully ready to transact. This dealer doesn't just sell cars to some of the biggest software CEOs in Silicon Valley. He's a true tech visionary and is building some of the most exciting technology in the automotive industry. Today, I'm speaking with Jeremy Beaver, CEO of Del Grande Dealer Group, a 17 store group from the heart of Silicon Valley. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. Before we get into the show, this episode is brought to you by Wide Whale, the auto industry's trust marketing platform. Wide Whale is the reputation engine behind thousands of dealers, including Lithia, Coons, Westhurst, Swickard, Herb Chambers, and many more. AI is here to stay, and Wide Whale is ready to help you take advantage. With brand new AI topic analysis tools, you can give structure to free text customer reviews. This allows you to reveal opportunities for improvement according to the voice of your customers like never before. Wide Whale AI analyzes every review to compile frequently mentioned topics. Paired with ratings and sentiment, your quarterly reports will go from, we have a 4.4 rating on Google, to our customers think wait time at our dealership is 30% worse than industry benchmarks. Now that's actionable insight. Wide Whale is the fastest growing reputation management vendor in automotive. You can learn more by visiting widewhale.com or clicking the link in the show notes below. This episode is also brought to you by Cars Commerce, the platform to simplify everything about buying and selling cars, including the quote unquote follow up. Let me explain. Dealers, fast and effective follow up is crucial for converting leads and customers. But here's the problem 40% of shoppers report that they are not getting timely or helpful responses from dealerships. This is a huge problem because your own team could be leaving four out of every 10 sales opportunities on the table. Cars Commerce makes it simple to measure and improve your follow up performance. A Cars.com experience report tracks the percentage of leads your team is responding to and how customers rate those responses. While Dealer Inspire's retailing technology enables your team to quickly text follow-ups with personalized financing options to make the most out of every opportunity. To learn more about how you can measure and improve your team's follow-up performance, go to carscommerce.inc slash experience or click the link in the show notes below. Jeremy Beaver on the CDG podcast. Jeremy, welcome. Uh, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be a great time. Yeah, it's going to be great. I never thought I'd have someone come on the pod. And the first thing they tell me is, look, man, I'm not a car guy. I don't love the cars. And then I tell him, I'm like, me and you both. No, but I, I, always, I always talk about this. Like I always say I love the business. That's, that's what always attracted me to this industry. Uh, but the cars was never, it was to me, I always viewed it as like metal right? It was the thing, like we're in the relationship business. And so, but it, there, there's definitely the two different types of dealers, right? There's the dealers that, and I have lots of friends like this who are obsessed with the car, obsessed with the metal, like they're passionate about it, the exhaust. And then there's me, I'm like, dude, like, let's find a good customer for this thing. That's right. Well, you know, first of all, the cars are cooler today than they've ever been, right? With the technology and all the items that are there. Uh, but for us at DGDG, culture, technology, modernization, better consumer experience. Um, that's really what we're focused on. Now, there are a lot of cars around here, so we do got to sell them and service them. So we got to love them a little bit, but uh, I don't have a huge collection of cars at home. So uh, sorry for everyone waiting to hear like, you know, what I got in the garage. <laughs> well, get, well get, give us your story. I mean, you've been f over 15 years with the group. You've had quite a tremendous rise from e-commerce director, and now you're running the entire group. Tell us a little bit about your background and your story. Yeah, well, I'll give you the, the quick elevator pitch, but um, I started in the car business out of high school. Uh, both my parents are uh, relatively well-educated. Uh, dad was in tech startup. Mom was a teacher. And I told him, hey, mom and dad, I don't want to go to college. Uh, I got this job making cold calls in a, in a BDC, uh, trying to get people to sell cars uh, and buy cars um, at an old Dodge dealer here in San Jose. And uh, worked my way up from there, then went to a tech startup uh, called Jumpstart Automotive which powers a lot of the online behavioral for road and track, car and driver, all of that fun stuff. And then um, I joined Shondell Grand uh, 15 years ago when we had three dealerships in 2008 and uh, have been able to really help the group grow with really what is a wonderful team here supporting every single day. And um, now it's become a, a pretty large scale business here in the Bay Area out in uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. How large scale? Give us a sense of your scale numbers, you know, units per year, service revenue. Yeah, we sell uh, about 25 to 30,000 retail units a year. So, uh, you know, I guess depending on the year and inventory and COVID, you know, that all skews. But uh, we do roughly about $1.3 billion in sales um, and have over a, over a thousand team members here, um, all local in the Bay Area. Since you joined the group, right? How much have you guys grown since that your early days in the group? 
Yeah, when I joined, we were selling roughly 3,000 cars, had about 150 people here. So it's been, a, it's been quite a journey uh, over the 15 years, um, and uh, it's been a really, really wild ride and, and pretty neat. Um, you know, we never thought we were set out to kind of build a brand here, you know, especially as a car dealer. And, you know, I don't, I don't know when you become a group, but I guess, you know, maybe it's when you get to like four or five or whatever that is. But um, now, you know, DGDG, uh, we have a yellow license plate in our brand really stands for a lot here, not only for consumers in the Bay Area, but also just who we are with our team. And so it's really neat uh, to be able to experience that, see that, but also just share in all of the growth and the opportunity that's been created for so many people in the organization. You know, for many of us that came into this industry, I always have this conversation, right? Like the, the classic, I never planned on being a car guy, right? I never planned on staying in industry. What was it for you that just kept sucking you in and you like, you know, tech guy, father's a tech guy, right? But you stay in the car dealership, auto retailing business. What, what was that for you? Like, why did you get sucked in and how did you endure over a decade? And neither, I mean, let alone with the same group, right? And the same, the same organization. What was it for you? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I was not really like I was good in school, but I just like it wasn't really exciting for me. And so. What I really just loved is I love to go to work. And what I found is that the more that I put in, the more that I'd actually get out of the car business. And so, um, you know, I could spend 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week at times and be able to, you know, outperform others. You know, maybe I wasn't the greatest at my job, but I could just outwork or outperform or learn and grow and, and be able to be coachable. And so what that really just provided was a platform for me to, you know, be able to, I guess, be where I am today. I mean, I guess when you're a 16 year old kid making cold calls, you're not thinking about being a CEO of a large dealer group. And even when I joined with Sean Del Grand, who's uh, the principal here, who's amazing, that was really never the path to start, but then has really evolved into this much larger situation, which is guiding tech, leading people, having opportunities for people to live and grow in the Bay Area. And so um, it's been a it's been a really cool journey. I, I definitely you know, I'm still definitely not the smartest guy. That's for sure. I make more mistakes here than anyone. Um, but to be able to do it in a team environment, have a lot of wins and celebrate them. Um, it's just a really cool business. And there's so many different verticals. It's changing so much, especially with technology and consumer trends and marketplaces and A to Z online sales and the directions that, that that's really going. And then, you know, probably for me at the end of the day, like we're in the heart of it all. If you're in Silicon Valley with Google, Apple, Facebook, you know, everything, EVs, uh, we can probably talk about that a little bit today. Uh, this is where it all starts. And so it's really exciting to really challenge yourself to modernize what has historically been a little older school business and modernize it as fast as possible because the consumers not necessarily only want it, they now expect it here in the Bay Area. I have to imagine that your consumer is very different than most of my guests on this podcast, right? Like you are in the epitome of, you know, tech and, you know, innovation and startups, right? Silicon Valley, SF. I mean, what are, what is it like, just like very broadly speaking, what is it like running a dealership in such a place? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's something different every day. That's for sure. There's no dull moments around here. Um, you know, I think the first thing from the consumer is they expect the experience at DGDG to be like everything they already do in their life in Silicon Valley. So heavy tech, heavy speed, heavy efficiency, uh, world-class guest experience, everything on an iPad. Like, it's just like, that is like the, the barrier of entry to start. So that's like a very tricky thing because <laughs> there's cost, there's all these different things. And then for a business, right, this is a very expensive place to do business. Cost of real estate, cost of team members, um, you know, all of the things that go into running a business in a major metro and then in the state of California. Um, and a very, very educated consumer. So very high FICO, a lot of cash, um, a lot of stock option stuff that goes on around here. And so you just need to be very versatile in the business and then very nimble. And so we really pride ourselves, um, you know, to be able to, you know, move and jive while we're still a, you know, we're a small, still, we're still a small business compared to the, you know, the large publics that are out there, but 
um, for the Bay Area as a family run operation. Uh, you know, I'm not part of the family, but I, th- I guess I've been here 15 years, so I'm pretty much an adopted son. Um, but you know, like we we really pride ourselves on being large scale, but still very quick to react to market conditions and trends. So that's a really really important piece. Um, while you have a business at scale, right, selling 30,000 cars and servicing a couple hundred thousand, there's a lot of guests that come through these facilities every year. Yeah, look, I'm checking out your website as you're speaking, man, and, and look, very clean, right? I, I see what you're saying, right? Very, I mean, very airtight, very thoughtful about every single uh, call to action. I can tell, like, you don't overdo that. So you you passed the smell test. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a good start. Um, all right. So, yeah, right. By, by the way, you said stock options. I'm, I'm curious, like, how does that play into like any of, you know, just deals, financing, right? I can imagine you get of, a lot of that It's kind of weird there. because, you know, like it's not something that we really would like track back in the day. But now when, you know, you got companies like NVIDIA that are here and that stock goes through the roof or, you know, Apple stock does well. I mean, you see these people buying cars, uh, which is pretty crazy. And so um, it's a really, it's kind of a little bit of a bubble in the economy, which is great. So there's never, you know, besides a, a dot-com boom, it stays pretty level. But again, a very educated consumer. And so price is a big sensitivity. Um, they know more about a lot of these cars than you know some of our product specialists because they're just very smart and educated. Not that that doesn't exist across the country. You just have very concentrated areas um, in each one of those pieces where they, they know what they know and um, you know it's what they're used to. So I want to talk a little bit about just from a tech perspective, right? G- give us an overview of what is it like, like how are you operating your dealership and really keeping it, to, like you just mentioned a lot of tactical things you're doing to meet the modern demands of you know the consumer. But give us a, I wanna get a little bit of an overview of how you're really doing things differently, um, given the fact that you are in this hotbed that is so receptive to tech. I can only imagine, right? Like I think the beauty of being where you're at is that you can really test things and you'll probably get adoption very quickly. Right. People will try. People want to, you know, experience, right? If you try to sell a car online and maybe an area in the country that's a bit more rural and the average age is, you know, older, maybe people are not going to be as receptive. So what are some of the things you're doing at your store differently? Right. Like, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So let me just kind of get we have a couple of different thoughts on tech. Um, and the first one is kind of like our overarching strategy, which is why can't you buy and service your car? With just like you do anything else in your life. So pick your favorite brand, whether it's Starbucks, Ritz Carlton, like whatever experience you like in a retail environment, why can't buying, selling, and servicing your car be that easy? And so we really focused on that efficiency through technology. Now we do really need the people still because they're the performance driver and they're dealing with our guests, which is awesome, but you need a technology that's gonna be able to integrate and do that. So we really have three options. We can buy out of the box kind of platforms. And so, you know, we could buy things that are automotive tech today. A lot of those are legacy platforms that aren't kind of modern day tech. So they don't have what consumers call, you know, their APIs, their data integrations to have consumer flows. It's really, really tough. Number two, we can go invest in some companies, right? And we can be partners with them. We can beta with them, you know, and we can take automotive tech or non-automotive tech. Or um, in step three is we actually go build our own tech um, on things that are on the modernization scale for a consumer flow. And that is really around how do you take everyday tools? So think of things like a Salesforce or a Microsoft Azure or even Office 365. And how do you bring them in to the automotive industry so that then you can create efficiencies in processes with people and with our guests? And so we do all three of those. Um, you know, so our team today looks like we have roughly 10 in-house people just on our team that are actually at DGDG from project managers, UX, UI designers, um, you know, consumer experience designers. Um, we have a full-time CTO. We have a product manager to help us, uh, you know, uh, shape projects. And then we have a whole engineering team that's over, overseas um, that helps us build a lot of these. And then in our, our technology marketing team, we have 32 people that are on that team that run from social to um, online experience to our own search engine marketing company. So we have a lot of different, um, what we would call economies of scale that help us move faster, 
quicker and then meet those consumer demands um, on those pieces. Some of the things that like I get, I think consumers don't see is we also, we focus a lot on automotive data. And so this industry is always changing. Supply, demand, inventories, pricing. Um, you know, we are, uh, we're not a one price organization when it comes to selling cars new and used, but what we manage to is what we call a price to sale gap. And that's what we price the car online at to what we sell the car. And our average transaction is under $200 from what we have the car online to what we sell the car. We really believe in having that right price up front. And some people, you know, want to come in and negotiate and do all those things. Our entire team is um, on our sales team. They're called product specialists. They're all non-commissioned. So they're here to help the right person find the right car that fits their needs. They're not paid on if they charge you more for the car or charge you less for the car. So to do that properly, we got to use a lot of market data to make sure that, that it aligns with what the consumer is seeing. Um, you know, when they go on KBB or when they go to cars.com and they go look at those marketplaces, which we really believe um, that they're seeing the same thing when they get to DGDG. All right. So a lot to unpack there. Okay. Number one, you have this team of, you mentioned like over 30, 40, just individuals working on tech, on MarTech. I mean, everything to do with your product. What are they doing? And then, but more importantly, what's the net result, right? What is different? That's a big investment to make annually, right? I've hired tons of engineers. I've hired, hired engineers overseas. It's not cheap and it's a lot to manage. What is the net result of all that? Yeah, the first one is just efficiency and scale. Um, and so when you think about growing a business, so we've gone from three stores to 17 stores, we need to have platform type strategies that allow us to buy a store and go in and put our tech and be able to op operate it overnight under the DGDG platform. We, um, in our stores, we have essentially standardization that we have across the entire group. So a consumer has the same experience and our team has the same experience. So that's like the kind of the highest level. When you use technology through efficiency, there is also um, what is called SGNA, so expense strategy, that we really try to minim or maximize the expense reduction strategy using technology because costs are so high in the Bay Area that we really focus on that um, from those pieces. On, an, on a manufacturer level, um, so think about like the brands that are out there, guest experience is critical for them. So our customer satisfaction scores, we really target to be in the top 10% of the country in all of our stores. So with that, and it really makes us be able to have a strategy to empower with the guests that are there as well. And so we use it in many different functions. In a day-to-day -day operation, we try to remove any manual reporting or manual guesswork. Everything is run from our data reporting engine, what we call DG, DG dash. And so instead of having 40 different people doing Excel sheets and all that stuff, it's 100% automated and delivered to the proper people to do really understand what's going on and make the proper changes on a day to day. And what type of reporting are you referring to? Everything, uh, anything from um, time cards for our team to daily sales tracking to inventory strategies to um, search demand for vehicles on websites to leads, appointments, um, financial statements, uh, you name it. Uh, we probably have a report for it. So um, we're kind of, we're you know, I guess we're, we're car guys, but we're probably more data geeks than anything. But it's really important when you're using data is not just having the data, but how does it actually become usable in a day-to-day -day operation? Take us deeper into your tech stack. I think it's one of the things I'm most interested here is you mentioned the combination of building versus buying and you know everything in between um, and just the ability to, of course, extract more efficiency, especially given the fact that you're a large group. You know, you have many, many different stores and you want to standardize everything, right? What does your tech stack look like? I mean, just break it down for us kind of piece by piece. Yeah, um, I think today in the strategy, it starts with um, receiving all of the data sets into a Azure data lake uh, using Microsoft's platform that we then use business intelligence tools to kind of structure the data the way that we want it. Um, some of the large challenges in automotive still are being able to one just get the data from our partners um you know so from the big box you know partners that are out there and then getting it in a way that is actually consumable for our team to use so we focus a lot on data aggregation um to start and that is really through the azure platform 
We use a Office 365 platform for almost all of our communication internally. And then from our consumer views, um, over the last couple of years, we have built a in-house Salesforce tech stack. So it's called Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, uh, Marketing Cloud for our consumer data platform. And that is where we see all the consumer views of all of our guests so that we can track, you know, who, you know, what they've done every single time, household um, purchases. Do they have open recalls? Are they coming up for their lease? Like all of those different items. But all of that data is really fed from the one repository, which is the data lake, which gathers it from, you know, 40 different sources for us to operate our business every single day. So definitely more like not a normal car dealership operating that way. Normally a car dealership has, you know, a DMS and we have a DMS as well, but we use that more as an accounting function um, that we report the way that we need to do to our, our manufacturers and certain items. The consumer facing tools are historically, um, our strategy is a much more modern format of one system if we can. Mm -hmm. Man, it sounds like, Everything you've built in our building, that alone could just be licensed out as an entire platform. Could be. <laughs> All right, so Jeremy, talk to me a little bit about consumer, right? Again, given the fact of where you're at, um, in my experience with online retailing, right? Where do you think the market is headed? What, what do you see from a consumer demand perspective? And do people want to still buy online or 100% online? you know, hybrid of in-store, what do you kind of see as the future for this, for this, um, for online car, for car buying in general? For sure. Well, we could probably talk on this topic for an hour on uh, the trends and the scenarios. So I'll give a, a kind of a quick background. Um, when COVID happens, the dealers really shift to a model where it's digital retailing. It becomes the hottest thing ever. Buy your car online, COVID, all those different things. Um, as it really shifted then to really low supply, high demand, the dealers were like, well, you know, like everyone's got to come find a car and all these different things. And now we're more into what is kind of a normal transaction besides high interest rates for consumers and some of those, those functions that are there. Today, um, there's still a lot of work to do in the entire automotive industry. Consumers, I believe, will continue to shift to buying their car online in a fashion more and more every single day, but the tools are still just not perfect and they're not fully ready to transact. And so while there are, um, there's been tremendous progress. So companies like Upstart who have really gone out and tried to figure out AI powered financing and online financing and the ability to take the consumer A to Z, but also pick up in the dealership where they left off with iPads, which is a very important process here at DGDG. But at the end of the day, not many customers are going online, buying their car and fully signing everything, including DMV, getting their loans in the normal retail world across the United States. And so there's a lot of work to do still with DMV, with forms, with banking relationships where a consumer can go buy a new or used car online and make that process as easy as anything else. Um, and so we're, we've made a lot of progress, but there is still a lot of work to do. And that involves partnerships with our manufacturers and with all of the other uh, kind of vendors that goes along. But the consumer, just like they do anything in their life, they're doing it more online. What I do believe a trend really, um, that has been a kind of an age old car business trend for a long time is this lead submission. And what happens is in the in the world, the customer goes on to a you know a website and they go like put their phone number and email and then like all these people call them. It's really like antiquated if you think about it. I don't know for you, but I don't know when's the last time you went online and gave gave all your information for someone to call you back. But I haven't done it in a while. I think that what you see consumers are still doing that today because they're just not still getting enough of the fully transactable information to just complete it online. And so that's really our goal. Um, and especially here in the Bay Area, we think that we should be, you know, early, early stage to bring that um, on fully, you know, adopted. But today in our stores using our Upstart platform, we have the customer either start online or finish in store on the iPad over 85% of all transactions at DGDG. So tech usage is extremely high here in the Bay Area. This episode is brought to you by my very own car dealership guy, Industry Job Board. CDGjobs.com, my industry job board connecting the best talent in automotive with the best companies will remain absolutely free for CDG listeners to post and fill available roles at their companies. 
This free job board is for anyone in automotive, vendors, dealers, lenders, manufacturers, auto tech, everyone. Already, over 100 companies have posted open positions, including Lithia Motors, Recurrent, Credit Acceptance, Vero's Credit, Cars Commerce, Shift Digital, Plug, Full Path, Westlake, Trade Pending. You get the point. The best part is that when these companies hire through cdgjobs.com, they are hiring the most informed candidates in the marketplace. So don't hesitate. You can add your open roles today by visiting cdgjobs.com or clicking the link in the show notes below. That's cdgjobs.com. It seems like you've, you're have just a culmination of lots of feedback from your customer and continuing to kind of build on top of it. How, are you, how have you systematized that? Right? Like how are you actually getting feedback from your customers and creating a better car buying experience that suits the need of your specific customer? And I think, I think this is very relevant to people all over the country because it doesn't matter if your customer is extremely tech savvy or if they're, you know, a Luddite, the, at, the, at the end of the day, like, you, you know, they have some needs and you want to morph to those needs or, or you know, they'll give them what they want. So how are you doing that? Well, I couldn't have said it better. I think, again, right, I'm going to talk from Silicon Valley out here, but you can take any of the, you know, antidotes and you just make it fit to however it fits in your business, right? And I think that's really critical and that's how the car dealerships really operate. And so I think for us, we just do a lot of testing, get a lot of feedback, use a lot of listening tools. Um, We take, you know, when you sell that many cars and service that many cars, uh, there's going to be a heck of a lot of good experiences, but there's going to be a lot of experiences to learn from as well. And so we're a retail business. Um, we do make mistakes. We're not perfect. Uh, cars break, by the way. So there's not fun, you know, not enjoyable times for that for consumers. Um, and so we just do a lot of um, whether they're case studies, whether they're UX, UI tests, so user studies where we see what people click on, what they use. We take, you know, adoption rates. Um, and then again, we also, you know, good or bad, we watch, um, you know, a lot of the leading and top performers. And so, you know, Tesla is a big market share here in the Bay Area or the Rivians or any of even the startups. Uh, you know them all. Um, we watch and we see what's working for them, what's not working for them. And, you know, how can we fit that into our own business model? And so um, we're just, you know, we, we live with the thought of we always want to be uh, getting better. And so we're not, we're never going to be stagnant. We always want to improve. And we also, don't know what we don't know. And so we're very open to learning, very open to change. And, you know, as always, you know, sometimes we try things, they don't work. Uh, that's, that's a part, that's part of life. Oh, we built some tech that doesn't work and we scrap it. Or we, um, you know, we've had a new process and it sounds great. And then we're like, yeah, that was not such a good idea. And so fail fast and, and then, you know, pick up and move on. And so we're just, um, we're not set in our ways. And I think that that mentality throughout the entire organization really then helps build a better consumer experience because they know that we are always thinking of them and at, we're, at least we are really trying if that makes sense when you you know any you go to a restaurant or you go to um you know pick anywhere and they make a mistake but they care and they're like oh hey like we'll fix it and it wasn't mistake. that's all people really want right like they know that this is real life and so we just really have an attitude of you know being able to take care of our guests and each other every day. Man, you're quite an enigma. <laughs> I want, I, I, I t- let's talk some brass tacks here, right? You're doing all this fancy stuff. I mean, you're, you're running a tech business. You just happen to sell cars. Uh, that's clear to me at this point. How does your profitability stack up with other dealers, right? Like give us like your, your profit per vehicle. I mean, how does that rank? Yeah, I think in the Bay Area, we're probably level. I think, you know, I think that there's, again, many different ways. I think we talked about, you know, some of these costs that we have today in our business. We think about them more as investments. So while they do show up as, you know, an expense, it's really an investment for us to have a better, brighter future for, you know, consumers and our team. It's also been, has been what has enabled us to grow to the size we are. So maybe there's some dealers that have had you know, three stores and they now they have four and we've, you know, gone from three to 17. So maybe there's, you know, a higher, a higher total dollar there. But, you know, I would just tell you, um, you know, I have, you know, I get to shout out to, you know, my boss, uh, who's the chairman, Sean Doe Graham, but like his, his mentality is really, you know, really cascaded through the organization. We are a for-profit company, so we got to pay the bills and we got to pay our team and all that stuff. But this is not, we don't run this business like, we need to squeeze every last dollar out of it. And we really, you know, are mindful of our team and growth and partnerships and, you know, not squeezing vendors and all of those things. And so, you know, 
could we probably make a little more if we wanted to go do some different stuff or not have a you know a team here that works at DGDG and all the fun stuff we're talking about yeah but you know what for us life's too short we want to have a lot of fun we want to bring a lot of people along the way and so um i've been very blessed to you know be able to be part of this but i also have you know i have a lot of free reign to to do a lot of this fun stuff so uh, that's what makes it really exciting but i think that's what drives um what you see here at DGDG every day so um um, yeah, pro- you know, I, there, I'm sure there's way more profitable car dealers than us. Like that is, uh, you know, and that's that's okay too. And that's you know, everyone gets to do it um, their own way, and that's kind of the beauty of the, the franchise system in the United States. So I, I I do want to talk about AI, which is you know has been making waves in our industry. Lots of conversation about it. Uh, you mentioned that you're doing some stuff with Upstart on AI. Upstart is a partner of the podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about what are you doing there? Yeah. So, um, you know, when we found the original platform from Upstart, it was actually a different company called Prodigy. It was a startup in a, in like a garage room in San Francisco. We found it. So this is the one that we partnered with um, and then ended up doing some deals with. And so we helped build their digital retailing tool, which was the consumer facing part of how you would buy your car online. That company then got bought by Upstart, which is really a AI powered lending solution that they spent a lot of their career um, from the business in the personal lending side. Some Google executives, a really, really neat executive team over there. And so they did a lot of personal lending using AI. And now they have brought that into the auto lending space. So today, if you're at DGDG and you're online or in the store, we, we actually use their lending platform to offer um, using their lending platform to offer them, you know, a loan from one of, you know, 100, 200 banks across the nation all real time using, you know, very sophisticated, um, you know, uh, AI technology, which is verifications of identity, residence, income, and get them the absolute best rate from a bank that they may or may not ever have heard of before, because at least in our belief, while we do a a lot of business with our captives, which is where the the manufacturers, that's the banks they use. Um, We do tons of relationship with that, but you need a secondary tier for financing. They are um, our number one secondary tier lender because consumers just love the process, um, which is really neat that we can say, hey, here's the iPad. Here's the lowest rate available to you. And the customers absolutely love it. They don't necessarily care as much that it's a main bank, right? Like if you can save some money, like let's save some money to, you know, they'll, they'll fund your car loan. So let's do it. Right. Um, which is really, really neat. And so they're, they align a lot with us because they are a tech company, by the way, they're a, you know, large market cap out and they're a public company. Um, and so it's really cool that with our tech mindset and then working with a tech company, uh, we get to move stuff pretty quickly, uh, between the two. Talk to me about talk to me about AI. I mean, you did mention AI lending, um, but I'm curious to hear your take on the state. First, like the state of AI and automotive today. Secondly, actually, let's just start there because I have a bunch of follow up questions to that. Yeah, I think um, it's really, really fragmented. I think it's like everyone wants to throw around that word and then they don't even like, really know what it is. But it's like a tagline for a product or a service right now. And again, like so, so, so what is it in your mind? What is it in your mind? I think that. Um, they're trying to take modern items that are essentially like doing human work and being able to like create efficiencies into these car dealerships. Yet most of the car dealerships don't have the tools or resources to utilize it in a proper way. Um, so, you know, CRMs aren't fully designed to be able to write things, even AI chat or, you know, predictive analytics for business behavioral tools. Like they don't have systems that are going to actually take that data and then deliver it in a usable format, which by the way, it will get there, but it's not like the engines that these car dealerships operate on today. They're still very, very legacy and not tech forward. So what we're trying to do is take like 1990s to 2000s tech and then bring in like 2023, 24 and trying to like do let them do some of it together. Yet there's 40 different companies that are down here. And so again, I, I've, I've seen a lot in our modern stuff, like our Salesforce stuff. We can use it at certain times. Um, I just think it has a long way to go for scalable platforming in the auto industry for the future. Within, within no doubt, um, it will happen. It's just a matter of time, in my opinion. When you say it will happen, right? Like, what's going to happen? Is it going to replace people or is it going to make them more efficient or more both? Efficient. I, I think that I still believe this is a very human business, but I think if you like, let's just take very small examples. Let's say in 
um, in two examples. Let's talk about in, in sales. Well, if a product specialist can go from selling 12 to 18 cars, like that's better for all of us. They make more money. They have more opportunity for growth. Maybe it becomes more all appointment driven. It does more efficient follow up. So there's less waste. Um, there's just all of those different things that I think are better for the consumer experience and the team member experience. Maybe on the tech side, like maybe instead of them like handwriting all notes about cars, it like reads what all the work is done and it creates them from typing, you know, 47 different lines on every repair order. And so I think that there's those types of efficiencies. There is for sure on the marketing front going to be like, you know, just think about how every normal company markets to you. That's where there's, you know, a lot of efficiencies in marketplaces and all of those. And I think those are the easier ones because they have the largest change of spend. And those other companies are very, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they can move at a different pace than trying to get 17,000 franchise car dealers to do the same thing. And, and that's, that's kind of one of the challenges in the industry, right? If you're a public group, you want to do it a certain way. Or if you're DTDT, you do it a certain way. Or if you have one store, which, you know, there's 9,000 dealers that have one store, then they do, they all do it completely different. And so to get continuity um, in this, in this automotive industry, we still have a long way to go to work together. And it's what we believe should happen. Mm hmm what parts of our business do you think are going to change the most? I mean, you mentioned marketing, which is, you know, a certain segment, but any other specific parts that you think will be like really severely impacted um, positively, of course, but, you know, impacted by just better technology, more efficiency, anything specific come to mind? Yeah, I think these marketplaces are really going to change. So think of like companies like Cars Commerce or, you know, even Auto Trader or True Car. I think that there's just so many shoppers online, right? They have tens of millions of uniques and they can re really continue to focus on that consumer experience of finding the right car and then being able to transact on that car in a more meaningful way. And I think that is really gonna create efficiency in the system for the dealers, the marketplaces and the consumer, almost like a three-sided marketplace, um, which uh, we, you know, we really believe in. And I think that that's going to allow them to compete with you know, companies more like the Tesla or more like some of the startups, um, you know, Carvana has done a really good job um, on used. And you've seen that they've just, you know, they've proven a lot of these models, um, you know, full disclosure, they're friends of mine. So, um, but I just think like they're, they're, it, what they've proven is consumers like these experiences. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the dealers have a lot, you know, mostly all the new cars and a big chunk of the used cars. And I think that there's room for everyone. I really do. Like, uh, you know, some people that's probably not a, you know, a, a popular thing to say, they're like, you know, Carvana or whatever. But like, I think that, you know, they can still continue to grow, but the dealers still have massive opportunity to, to sell more cars through the private party system on use and all these different things that at least in my lifetime, like we're going to have awesome opportunity. That's for sure. Where do you think a company like Carvana fits in the in the marketplace over the you know the upcoming future here? I mean, it, you know, a couple of years back it was all the rage you know throughout COVID, and you know now things have subsided. You know, Carvana's still they're still growing, but where do you think they fit in the marketplace? Yeah, I just think they you know they determine how they want to have what they want to have unit economic growth or they want to have volume growth. Um, you know, where does that business position from you know the future of of scaled markets? Um, I mean, that team, uh, I'm not sure if you ever had him on, on your on your set yet, but I mean, you know, Ernie Garcia, I mean, he's a he is a an extremely, extremely built, brilliant man, plus that leadership team that's there. So, you know, I do believe that they're going to be able to figure out a lot of things. Um, and they have, you know, very similar to what we're talking about. I think if we just said, like, how do you boil it down and why do you say that? Well, I think they're focused on the same thing we are, that consumer experience, like, how can you make it more modern? How can you make it better? Car buying doesn't have to be, you know, difficult. It should be really fun. And, you know, so I think from our holy grail, we're all focused on that same area. And so that's why it's always cool to see what they do. Now, you know, I, do we want to, you know, grow and sell more cars and all that stuff? Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. So, um, you know, I guess that's to be seen on Carvana. That's the, the crystal ball maybe I don't have. You know, so wh when you were, while you were speaking, and I was still on your website, I saw that dealer inspire at the bottom of your website built your website. I was curious. I was trying to understand why you decided to work with a third party for your website, given the fact that 
it's such a critical component. It's your it's your storefront, right? It's like it's so important. It's where everyone lands. And so why did you go with a third party? In this case, Dealer Inspire, who's again phenomenal websites. And I'm a part and they actually did my website as well. Uh, so go ahead. Why, why did you decide yeah. to do that? Well, I think I'm gonna go back to just the very beginning, which is uh what we focus on when we choose, when we're when we're talking about partnering with tech. Uh they have been an unbelievable partner. And so we've known Alex Vetter and the team over there at Cars Commerce for a long time, uh, pretty much my entire car business career. Um, you know everyone. <laughs> I, well, I don't, you know, I think, I, maybe they want to talk to me sometimes. You, <laughs> you probably, do you, do you have stock in all these companies? I, I mean, know, what's I, going I, on? I, Carvana, I, this. I'm going to send you as my new negotiator. This is what I'm going to do. It's going to be perfect. Uh, um, I'm telling you, all, everyone that's on the podcast, they seem to be like, you know, affiliated over here. That's what's it. going on? Well, hopefully they'll say nice things about me. We'll see. But um, no, so anyway, so we have, <laughs> So, so we have done a lot of like technology usage and stuff with Cars Commerce. And then when Dealer Inspire, which was a startup in Naperville uh, with Joe Chura and the team over there, um, we connected and they have done so much. We do a ton of custom dev work on that website, you see. So they allow us to do all those things. It, it's very, very dynamic. It's not like the car dealer website. And then they allow us to push us. But this is a perfect example. We don't need to go build website platforms. They have one that's perfect. We just want to customize it to make sure it's like crazy modern. And thank you for saying unbelievable things about the website. But by the way, like we're already on like, wait till you see the new version. Like that thing's about to get scrapped and it's already great. Um, we're going to do some really, really cool stuff in the future with them. And they want to push the boundaries as much as anyone else. And so that is like for us as, you know, being tech guys or being, you know, modernization automotive guys finding awesome partners like like those like all of them over there to like try stuff and break stuff and push them out of their comfort zone that's why that name's on that website because like we're proud like that is like amazing and so it's really um it's really really cool i love it you know you i was thinking as you were speaking about um earlier you were mentioning the fact that your consumers are you know all work for these tech companies and you might already be doing this, right? Uh, but as like a marketing campaign, like imagine just sending emails to people that like, like whoever has the biggest spike in the stock, it's like, oh, this stock is up 100% in the last three months, automatic, let's send an email. Hey, you, you're fucking rich now, like come buy a car. Like not actually like using that language, but it's like tracking the stock performance of tech companies in your region and targeting them with, you know, language that resonates it's like hey we know you have money now <laughs> come buy a car <laughs> so anyways you're, just, already, just putting... you're already on the marketing team this is perfect i mean this is exactly i'm trying to bring some value yeah yeah <laughs> i love it um all right so before we wrap up i want to know um talking more about the market side um what are you seeing in your market in your market today right i have to imagine that you have a lot of EV buyers in your market. Uh, EVs have been, the prices have gotten slashed over the past year. Lots of people, you know, underwater. So give give us a little lay of the land of what you're seeing in the yeah, market. So we're, um, you know, by the way, we're, we're super pro EV. We think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a really important deal here in the Bay Area over the coming years. Um, but we're in a very weird gap of time. And that's really how we deal with it. We deal with it kind of in the, you know, we'll call it control what we can control. Um, EVs have been hot. Um, now EVs are, you know, there's a lot of negative press out there for um, charging across the country and hybrids are now really hot. And so it's really like ebb and flows. Um, Tesla plays a major part. Um, they have a massive, massive market share here, larger here than anywhere else in the country. Um, you know, 30% of your know, or high 20s of every single car sold is a Tesla, um, which is not unlike anywhere else in the country. Um, the entire Bay Area is 40% EV or plug-in hybrid. Um, in a market share. So, you know, think about those compared to seven, eight percent in the entire nation. This is where it all happens. Um, but with that being said, um, there's a pretty strong price point situation going on where some of our manufacturers qualify for federal rebates. Some of the manufacturers are incentivizing their cars, but the average EV is still 40 to 50 to $60,000 in a lot of our brands, where a Model 3 and a Model Y is 30 to $35,000, right? And so you have these large gaps in pricing still, which is, you know, again, Elon, uh, they've done an amazing job building that brand. Um, there's just a, there's just a price discrepancy on where they're at today. Um, and by the way, that's going to get solved. There's going to, the OEMs are going to build cheaper cars. They're going to figure out, you know, where the, where the world's going. They're going to get the tax credits with the batteries. 
who knows what change of office does, all that stuff. So today um, we're still selling a lot of EVs. Uh, margin's not great uh, on those EVs today is uh, in the bank. What do you mean by that? Like, um, yeah, what, do you mean, what do you mean by margin's not great? What happens is, you know, it, when we have a, you know, a high supply of cars, um, then, you know, you have two options. The, OE, the manufacturers, they incentivize the cars from themselves or the dealers have to drop prices. And that's, um, there's, uh, in cars, there's, you know, I think everyone like the, 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 I don't know what the, the world thinks, but it's like that every time we sell a car, we make, you know, so much money on every car. That's not how these car dealerships work, especially here in the Bay Area. Um, we need every department to work. We need sales, service, uh, parts. We need it all to work to have a successful business. We don't, we don't make $10,000 a car around here. Um, so I think, you know, it, it just really, it goes into the margin strategy that's there. And especially um, car dealers um, have to hold cars and we pay interest on those cars that we're holding. And, uh, you know, you know, interest rates are not uh, not at an all time low today. So uh, we really try to move through the inventory efficiently. But all in all, positive EV OEMs are definitely coming. So many new models out so much better range. We have an infrastructure here in the Bay Area that can support EVs, which is great and carpool. Um, but uh, we're in a gap of time where, uh, you know, it's all depending on what the news says on how the consumer feels today. Mm hmm. That's true. What do, what are you doing on the server side, right? Like I have to imagine you're doing something different there as well, or more innovative, modern. What are you doing there? Yeah, I think for us, um, you know, it's just probably use of technology, iPads in every drive, online payment systems, um, you know, videos, um, you know, text messages with photos. Mm -hmm. Just more of like we try to focus on not taking the tech too crazy there because it's like it's already kind of a stressful piece of like you're getting your car. There's be a bill like we try to just make the communication simple and easy and not like what you're used to over you know life cycles of cars and that's really that's been the majority of our focus um to create streamline again we sell 25 30 000 cars we service a couple hundred thousand cars so simple processes that are just better um and more efficient are better than trying to do like evolutions um at least in our stage today so before we wrap up, I mean, anything that when you think about just where the car business is headed, right? Anything specific that excites you? How do you just think about these next couple of years? Yeah, I think for a, you know, a non-car guy who's a car guy, um, like, I think the cars are just cooler. Like, they connect to everything in your life. They, you know, they have like bigger screens. They're like easier to drive. They're like, I mean, cars are cool. I mean, which is great because, you know, you go back and look at cars 10 years earlier, you're like, that's not cool at all. Right. Um, and so I think that that's really exciting. I think there's um, significant strategies ahead on the consumer buying experience and servicing experience through technology, which I think is going to make people love the car experience even more. So like finding out what their car's worth every day or getting notifications that are really valuable to them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so I think there's a lot of new stuff that's coming along um, because the world is changing so fast that I believe the industry has changed faster in the last five years than it did the last five years in the last five years. And I think those gaps just keep getting shorter of evolution. And so for me, in Silicon Valley and with our team and with everyone here, like, why not? Like, how cool is it that I get to wake up every day and like push the needle and try new stuff? Like, that's what's probably most exciting for us um, that we can, you know, have not the same old, same old, if that makes sense. Jeremy Beaver, great having you in the pod, dude. This was awesome. Awesome. Well, excited to spend more time together and uh, been watching you from afar. So great to finally chat with you and uh, keep up the amazing work. And gosh, all the all the people following you every day. It's amazing the brand you've built. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming on. Really enjoyed it. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating. Consider subscribing to the show and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.